How you guys doing? My name's uh, Dr. George Maspoli. I'm from Hackensack, New Jersey. I'm part of a uh, group called One Surgical Specialist. There's three of us. Dr. Adam Rosenstock, my partner's here, and Dr. Stephen Pereira just had to go home because he's on ER call tonight. Thank you for having us. Uh, I got to actually uh, just update this. I do receive honoraria from uh, Intuitive. That was over a year ago. Uh, so we keep the slide up for seven seconds as we're supposed to. All right. It's a brief history where, you know, where I came from. I went to college in New Jersey. I went to New Jersey Medical School. I went to Rutgers New Jersey Medical School after that, and I did my fellowship at Hackensack. So I stayed in New Jersey for everything. I love the state, but not really, but I have no choice. It was great training. So I'm here to talk about percutaneous cholecystostomy tubes, really preoperative cholecystostomy tubes. You know, a lot of this data can be applied to, to abort a, sub, you know, a cholecystectomy in place one in, intraoperative, but I'm really going to focus on percutaneous cholecystostomy tubes. So you know, it's one of... One of the topics is near and dear to our hearts. We're very aggressive at coli tubes at our institution. Uh, we placed uh, 21 in the past year and a half at Hackensack, and uh, 16 of those ended up getting their gallbladder out. Five of them died. Uh, so, you know, we really are, it really is for the high risk population. But the first coli tube was done in 1980. It was it's usually placed in, uh, under ultrasound guidance. Sometimes, if you have a cirrhotic liver, you could do it under CT guidance because they could do it uh, transhepatic or, or, uh, or just right into the gallbladder. But you, obviously, if you have, if you have cirrhosis, uh, you don't want to go through the through the liver because you have a high risk of uh, post uh, post procedure hemorrhage. You know, you know, it, lot, I'm sure all you guys know about the Tokyo guidelines for cholecystitis. It's now cholecystostomy tube is now an accepted and recommended uh, treatment option for patients that are grade three in Tokyo in a Tokyo grade. Uh, and I'll go over that a little bit later. Or ASA three plus if I'm benefiting that. The most important thing about cholecystostomy tubes is that you got to have really good preoperative clinical judgment. The most important thing is to really um, kind of predict if it's gonna be a really difficult gallbladder before you're in the operating room. And I think it takes a lot of skill, just let, and I'm gonna go over some data to show how, how we could go over that, because if you know it's gonna be a difficult gallbladder, why go through all the risk of uh, having covert to open, having a bile duct injury, when uh, you know, the patient's diagnosis is cholecystitis and you could treat it with a coli tube. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, it's very important to have you know, good clinical judgment. Not every acute cholecystitis needs to go to the OR, and uh, you know, we've been teaching that to our residents or our medical students too. Um, so, you know, it, like I said, you know, a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube can be used as a bailout maneuver, as I stated here, but I'm going to be talking more about uh, preoperative. And it's a, you know, basic schematic of percutaneous cholecystostomy tube. The way it's done is, on, like I said, ultrasound or CT guidance is under sedation, maybe some local and some local anesthesia. Uh, the gallbladder is punctured with a 2218 gauge needle, and then you could go transhepatic, which is usually the preferred route, so therefore there's less biliary leakage or less complications from a misplaced coli tube. Uh, but obviously, if, it's, if you have a cirrhotic liver, you don't want to go through the liver. The bile is aspirated. Uh, it's sent for cultures. And um, this is not, there we go. And uh, an 8 or 10 French strain is placed over the wire into the gallbladder. Uh, the gallbladder is decompressed, and patients have you know, almost immediate uh, uh, relief of their symptoms. Uh, afterwards, I know uh, a lot of our patients go to a step-down unit. Uh, a lot of these patients, some of these patients do get a a transient uh, septic response because you know you're puncturing the liver, you go into an infected gallbladder. Usually, it's E. coli is the uh, bacteria that really grows out of these cultures, uh, and they get a, a, a septic response, become hypotensive. You gotta make sure that you're they're adequately resuscitated. But then, after a few hours, they feel much better. This is just an ultrasound showing uh, and an X-ray showing of a cholecystostomy tube. It's a very safe procedure. There's a 2.4 to 60 percent complication rate overall. Most of these are the tube is. Uh, you know, uh, mis uh, pulled out by mistake when a patient goes home. Uh, there is a very low rate of hemorrhage and is a, and is a very low rate of major complications overall. Mortality is zero to 1.4% in, in studies that uh, you can see online. Uh, afterwards, like I said, 1% of patients almost uh, have post-procedure sepsis. So it's important to monitor these patients and, and, like I, and like I said, put them in a monitored unit sometimes for just uh, the day after the procedure. And it's extremely effective. 90% of patients with cholecystostomy tubes have resolution of cholecystitis. And it usually, like I said, it happens within 24, 48 hours because their gallbladder is distended, cystic ducts obstructed, they have that pain from the pressure of the distended gallbladder. That, that pain immediately goes away because you're decompressing the gallbladder. And obviously you get sent off cultures, so therefore you can tailor your antibiotics and see exactly what grew out you know, in, in that, uh, in, you know, out of the bile cultures. Sometimes these patients have purulent uh, cholecystitis and you know, they feel much better afterwards. 54% 54, 54 of patients have a cholecystostomy tube. They don't end up having a cholecystectomy. Uh, that is a definitive management. There are reasons for that. Usually, these are sicker patients that aren't that are unfit for surgery. 
um, but it's still very effective for those patients. It is better than antibiotics. Antibiotics have an 80% resolution of cholecystitis, but cholecystostomy tubes have 90%. So that's why we like to do that uh, when we can. With our, we have a very good relationship with our interventional radiologists, and each time we order a cholecystostomy tube, we actually talk to them uh, in detail, and uh, they understand when we order it is usually well, well indicated. Uh, there is a variation in how many people receive for cholecystectomy afterwards, which is one of the uh, drawbacks of cholecystostomy tubes. It's kind of like having a colostomy. A lot of people don't get reversed. A lot of people don't get their gallbladders out. But we found in our practice, everybody that was fit for surgery in, in the last year and a half, all of them had an interval cholecystectomy. We do a robotic. Uh, we haven't had any bio leaks. We have never converted to open. And what we always say with each other is that is usually the gallbladder is not easy, usually in these cases, you know, electively, but it's definitely not harder because at least the acute phase of the inflammation is gone and all that's left is chronic inflammation. And, and just, just for robotics, you know, we use ICG, so it really helps us get the biliary anatomy um, a lot easier and a lot safer. Uh, but these cases can, are, are tough, uh, but they're definitely easier with the Coley tube afterwards. Uh, there is a selection bias on you know, who gets their, cold, their gallbladder, like I said. Uh, you know, usually the sicker patients don't end up getting the gallbladder out, and we had five patients that died in the past year and a half, never made it to cholecystectomy. So that's an argument for cholecystostomy tubes, because then if you did perform a cholecystectomy in those patients, they probably would have had a high perioperative mortality rate. Um, so we, we, I guess we chose wisely. Um, and uh, again, there's different ways that people use cholecystostomy tubes. For us, we use it as a bridge to surgery. This is George Washington Bridge from, you know, North Jersey. Let's go Yankees and Giants. Um, if you use it as definitive management, it, it really does have a high rate of, of non-resolution cholecystitis, like, like I showed, around 40%. But if you use it as a bridge to surgery, I feel like it's much more effective. This is just the uh, grade two and three uh, criteria for the Tokyo guidelines. Uh, you see grade three really shows uh, you know, signs of sepsis, which is uh, very rare for patients with cholecystitis to make it to this point, because uh, in America, you know, everybody gets a high scan, ultrasound, CAT scan, uh, antibiotics are sort of quickly. Um, but we do, have, we do have some patients like that that are very, basically uh, oncology patients, neutropenic, ACAC, cholecystitis, they get really sick because they don't have an immune response. Uh, grade two, we really uh, push for cholecystostomy tubes most of the time in our practice. The way, the, basically, our guidelines for us is you have three, three or more days of pain. If you have a CAT scan that the ER ordered, that we didn't order, but they, they ordered it, and you see a big grind around the gallbladder, you could tell it's going to be difficult. So we elect uh, to choose uh, to to put a uh, cholecystostomy tube in those patients and bring them back in six weeks for a gallbladder surgery. This is a really good summary of all the data you read online. The conversion rate of cholecystectomy of the gallbladder drainage is nearly half of a primary cholecystectomy in grade three patients. So therefore, it lowers your conversion to open rates. And we all know the morbidity of an open uh, cholecystectomy incision, uh, you know, more pain, more wound infection. And also, it, 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 and it has a highlight in the bottom of this quote, it may facilitate lap coli by reduced technical difficulty, and, we, and we're really true of believing that. So it can lead to an easier, minimally invasive cholecystectomy. The patient is done electively. They're, they're optimized. There's less acute inflammation. There's less bile duct injury rate. There's less conversion to open. Or maybe, at least in some studies, it's at least the same. Uh, but it does, uh, we feel like it does uh, provide a good option for these patients as a bridge to surgery. And we all know the morbidity of an open cholecystectomy, you know, the, obviously all, all, the, all the principles of a laparoscopic versus open, uh, you know, uh, surgery are applied, you know, less wound infection, less pain, quicker return to work, uh, there's a lower hernia rate, and opening does not make it easier. There's studies that show that when you open a gallbladder because it's difficult, it's going to be difficult to open too, and the bowel duct injury rate actually goes up when you open and you convert to open. Uh, we all know the morbidity of mortality of bowel duct injuries, so we feel like this makes it a little easier uh, when we have these patients bridge to an elective coli. So in sick patients with ASA and TG, Tokyo guidelines, 2018, grade three, just tube it and bridge it to surgery. Thank you.